you for joining us for our program online at Mechanics Institute for Seven Games, A Human History with author Oliver Roeder, who will be in conversation with our chess club staff, Judith Sartre, who is the general manager of youth outreach and events, and Paul Whitehead, who is our chess coordinator. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. If you're new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. And we feature our general interest library, um, an international chess club, which many of you know about, our ongoing author and literary programs, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. So please visit our website for all of our events, chess tournaments, schedules, and also know that the library is open. So please come on downtown and enjoy being with us in person. Our conversation today um, will be followed by a Q&A with you, our audience, and that will be in the chat. And also, if you're interested in purchasing Seven Games, a human history. Um, it's available through alexanderbook.com or at an independent bookstore near you. So I'd like to introduce our program. Checkers, backgammon, chess, go, scrabble, and bridge. These are seven games, ancient and modern, which fascinate millions of people around the world. In Oliver Roda's new book, Seven Games, he charts the origins and historical importance, as well as the myriad of rules and the ways that their design make them pleasurable to us. So whether you go to a game for social engagement, for pleasure, for entertainment, uh, intellectual challenge, or perhaps your competitive edge, I think Oliver's book will give you some wonderful insights about these seven games and also about the people who made their mark and made these games famous. It's an incredible read. It's beautifully written. And there are incredible anecdotes about the history as well as uh, how to play and what makes it important to human, human experience. So I'd like to uh, introduce, first of all, Oliver Roeder has been a senior writer at 538, an editor of The Riddler, a collection of the site's math puzzles. He studied artificial intelligence as a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, and he holds a PhD in economics focused on game theory. And he's here on Zoom uh, from his home in Brooklyn, New York. Also uh, with us, Paul Whitehead is our chess coordinator at the Mechanics Institute. He is the FIDE master, a USCF life master, and a former US junior chess champion. And also part of our chess staff, Judith Sartre is the general manager of youth outreach and events here at Mechanics Institute, of course. She was voted the 2017 Organizer of the Year by the U.S. Chess Federation and has been an international arbiter elect as well as an FIDE arbiter and developmental in instructor of the FIDE associate and a national tournament director of U.S. Chess Federation. And she's organized and arbitrated thousands of tournaments in person and online. And both Judith and Paul keep our chess club active and engaging every day with various tournaments and classes for all ages and all levels. So please welcome Oliver Roeder, Paul Whitehead and Judith Sautere. Hello, thank you for having me. Yes, we're so thrilled to have you, Oliver. And um, you know, when you're in, when you're out West, we really, We'll welcome you in person here at Mechanics Institute. But just to begin, you know, with your background, um, tell us about how you got started with this book, what inspired you and what motivated you to take a look at these seven games, um, you know, partly 
their board versus card games. And uh, what spurred you on in this direction? Yeah, happy to. And first of all, thank you for that very warm introduction. And, and thank you, everyone, for enduring two years of Zoom fatigue and still being here uh, this evening. As everyone sort of popped up on my screen, I was looking for my parents because they've been sort of cyber stalking me through uh, my book events, but I didn't see them. So mom and dad, if you're there, hello. Um, yeah, I'll tell you um, sort of a bit of uh, biography, which I think will, will serve to answer the question. So before I was a journalist um, and an author, I was an academic. Um, I was an economist uh, doing a postdoc at NYU. And I had this sort of classic academics problem, which they're in every academic is thoroughly convinced that what they're doing is very important. And they're also thoroughly convinced at the same time that not nearly enough people know about it. So I pitched a 538 uh, version of the research I was doing with the idea of getting it in front of in front of more people. And the editor um, at the site said, no, uh, we're not interested in that right now. Uh, however, he noticed online that I played competitive uh, tournament Scrabble, which I did at the time. And he said, <clears throat> instead of writing about all this serious stuff you've pitched us, how would you like to write about Scrabble instead? And I said, sure, why not? And my, the first uh, piece I ever wrote was a sort of profile of the world's best Scrabble player, uh, a man named Nigel Richards. And sort of from that um, very unexpected beginning in, in this career, sort of carved out a beat of, of covering games. And that's games pretty broadly defined. So Scrabble, of course, chess, video games, uh, crossword puzzles, sort of modern board games in the sort of golden age of board game design. Um, and I sort of, yeah, carved this out as, as something I could cover and, and try to cover seriously and, and well, which I felt not a lot of people were doing for, for a popular audience. And sort of there were two, two sort of big themes that emerged almost no matter what game I was reporting or writing about. And, and one was the passion and dedication of the subculture that favored that game, sort of the time, the energy, the intellectual energy, um, the, the love that, that these, you could find without fail in every subculture, that's thing one. And thing two was technology. In, in almost every game, there was the creep of technology in one form or another, um, often in the guise of artificial intelligence. So in chess, obviously you have the chess engines or in poker, they call them solvers, even in Scrabble, um, there's artificial intelligence or digital learning tools. And I was really fascinated by the collision between sort of thing one and thing two, uh, which leads us uh, to the book. Um, so that I wanted to tell, tell a story with, with two main strands, which are what I've described, sort of what is the importance, what has been and what is the importance of games to human culture and what has been the importance of games and the development of modern technology, specifically modern artificial intelligence and what happens when these two collide. So that was sort of the, um, broadly speaking, the impetus for the book. And yeah, I feel, I feel obligated to address the title, Seven Games. Um, there are seven chapters, each on a game, but I'm not, I'm not with this title and organization trying to make an argument that these are the only games um, about which we should care. Rather, they served um, some useful narrative purposes, and they have some nice features in common. They're fairly well known, um, I think, to most readers, which saves me a bit of time. They have very dedicated subcultures, very rich histories, and indeed have been uh, the focus of very uh, concentrated computer science research. So that's, uh, that's sort of the, a broad overview of the recent history and, and motivation for the book. Also, can you... Can you describe to us a little more about what game theory is? Sure. Um, so game theory, at least when an economist or a former economist like me talks about it, is essentially the study of interactions of small groups of people. And what do I mean by small? Well, I mean small enough where what I do might affect how you feel or what you want, what you want to do. So we call this, say, strategy or tactics. And this is as opposed to say something like um, macroeconomics, which studies uncountably large numbers of people and prices and things like this. 
a game theory studies a very small groups of people. And it could be groups of people like two playing a game of chess, say, or um, famous games like uh, The Prisoner's Dilemma. It doesn't need to be a classic board game, but basically studies the, the mathematics of strategic interaction and in many cases tries to solve for what are the best strategies or sometimes called equilibrium or Nash equilibrium after the famous mathematician John Nash um, to try to sort of predict almost how a given game that we write down might turn out using applied mathematics. And half the audience has now logged um, off. Also <laughs> I'm teasing. Yeah, the beautiful mind guy. That's right. Laura might have frozen there. In, in this second. research, and um, but I wanted, I wanted to know if um, if through this research that you did on the games that you you found through your research something that really changed your mind about one or other of the games. Yeah, I think I think there's a laundry list of of things I discovered that changed my mind about the games. I, two two most prominently come to mind and I can describe those. One is I think check, checkers gets a bad rap. Um, I had always thought of checkers as a sort of child's game, something sort of relegated to the elementary school cafeteria during you know indoor recess when it's raining outside but indeed i think one of the richest and most triumphant and most heartbreaking stories in the book if if i may say so myself has to do with checkers and the deep deep um love and passion um that checkers players have and that an early computer science um project took in the game so without spoiling uh, too much of uh, chapter one. Um, there was an early computer science project uh, out of the University of Alberta called Chinook. Uh, footnote, uh, Chinook is a wind that blows through Canada and checkers is sometimes called drafts. So draft, wind. So you had Chinook, this very important early computer science AI um, project on the one hand, and you have Marion Tinsley on the other. And Marion Tinsley uh, was the best checkers player that humanity has ever known. Uh, I would go further and say he's the best competitor at any competitive pursuit that our species has ever produced. And you can sort of guess what happened. The computer scientists wanted to beat this guy. And what, um, what ensued occupied both of these parties' lives um, for, for two decades and resulted in um, very fascinating human stories and um, and seminal um, AI research. And a, a, another brief side note, one thing I'm careful to, to say in the book is oftentimes these uh, contests that I'm describing are billed as man versus machine contests or human versus machine contests. And I would argue that's a misnomer essentially because behind the machine are, are equally dedicated human beings. Uh, so all of these contests are, are human versus human, just human in different guises. Um, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing is uh, personal, uh, more personal. I had never played much backgammon before I started reporting the book. And when I was reporting the book, I was careful to play all the games, you know, to get a, to get a flavor and have them in mind when I was writing. And I am now uh, a deep, deep backgammon obsessive. And the only thing that's disappointing about that is that I didn't discover the game 30 years before I did. Um, but the, the, again, those are just, just two of, of many things, uh, others of which I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get to. Great. Well, thanks. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Paul to, uh, to ask. Okay. <laughs> well, um, backhammon requires deep pockets, so it's good you're an economist. Maybe you can figure uh, out a way to fund your, your obsession. Uh, at least I've known a lot of backgammon players as well as chess players and other people involved in, um, in these games. So what interested me most about the book was the games that you were interested in the most and why those particular games fascinated you the most. I think it's, for me, it seemed to be two particular games, um, but uh, 
I, I'll leave it open to you and other people to interpret that. But it seems to me that um, it was poker and Scrabble that drew you the most. Um, and why? Yeah, that's, I think that's about right. Um, and one, you know, one question I often get when sort of doing, doing these events and answering questions about the book is put, put much more bluntly than you did, which is which are your favorite games, right? And you put it in a much nicer and subtler and richer way, but you know, that's, it's similar to asking someone, you know, to pick their favorite child, for example, it's difficult or it changes uh, based on the day or the context or sort of what have you done for me lately sort of considerations. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Scrabble is absolutely a game that fascinates me um, more than most, more than most, even in the book, I think it's fair to say. Uh, why? Well, for reasons I sort of hinted at earlier, I used to be um, a very uh, obsessive Scrabble player and devoted in uh, like an insignificant chunk of my of my life to this game. So that's that made it I, I wanted to do, you know, as thorough and faithful a job writing about it as I could. Why did but then uh, the, the logical follow up question is, well, why did it obsess me in the first place? Um, I was, I found, so Scrabble's interesting because a lot of the games in the book, chess, go back, backgammon, um, checkers, they have very few rules. Like the rules can roughly speaking be sort of written down on one page. But in Scrabble, the rules are the Scrabble dictionary, right? The dictionary is not a dictionary in the traditional sense where you would look up, you know, usage or spelling. It's a rule book and, and a word's appearance, a word's existence in the dictionary signals that word's validity in the game and a word's absence from the dictionary signals its invalidity. So by studying Scrabble, to, to learn Scrabble's rules, you have to learn roughly 200,000 words uh, to play the game, to play the game well. And I found this sort of study, like rote though it may be, may have been time consuming though it may have been, to be meditative essentially. I found it very sort of uh, calming in a sort of occasionally uncalm uh, period of my life. That was one thing. And two, I found Scrabble study to be this sort of oddly democratizing experience. So you have this set of 200,000 things. These things could be insects, foreign currencies, uh, medieval weapons, colors, you know, <laughs> obscure, whatever. And they're sort of all presented to you on equal terms and you ought to learn them all if you want to play Scrabble well. And I found this sort of equal presentation really, really fascinating and just became devoted to memorizing the rules of Scrabble. So when it came time to write about Scrabble, um, I was I was motivated and, and animated and I played in the North American Scrabble Championship as part of uh, reporting for that chapter, which provided, um, I think, a lot of color. I hope provided a lot of color. Um, so that's that's Scrabble and and poker. I, I mean, I'm glad you think that about poker. I, I I was I was happy with that chapter. Similarly, poker's democratic in a different sense, which is that anyone can play in the most um, celebrated poker tournament. All you have to do is fork over some money to uh, the person in the cashier's booth, and indeed, that's what I did. A chunk of my book advance uh, to the friendly lady in Las Vegas who happily took it and gave me a small slip of white paper which I gave to a poker dealer and I got a seat in the World Series of Poker and and anyone can do that you know I can't play in the World Chess Championship for example I certainly can't play in the in a elite go event um, but I can and did play in uh, the uh, World Series of Poker which again provides a lot of color and just I mean just a sea of, of humanity. I mean, Las Vegas is a dream uh, for a journalist because uh, everywhere you look, there's something interesting to write about. And, and I felt um, in playing in the World Series, a certain sort of camaraderie, um, like I'm playing ostensibly or nominally like against the other people in my tournament. But, you know, how often do you play in a, in a competition where there's 8,000 concurrent competitors? I think very rarely. So I felt, you know, we're kind of all in this together. And, and I sort of felt 
I felt very buoyed uh, by that fact. So what's the common denominator here? People and, and color, I guess, and, and this sort of tournament structure that exposed me to like all manner of fan and enthusiast of, of those two games. Yeah. And, and can I just add that both of those games contain um, a bit of imperfect knowledge as well, right? Which I thought was an interesting thing. So there's an element of luck there that doesn't exist in Go, Chess, or, or is not supposed to exist in Go, Chess, Checkers even. Um, uh, so yeah, that was, uh, that was, I felt your passion in those chapters. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's a great point about um, randomness and hidden information. Both both games have both of those things, and and the randomness is nice because you, well, because I, the sort of aspiring journalist, can arrive with like some sliver of hope, right? That I, this chapter might end with me winning a million bucks or the North American Scrabble. Of course, it didn't happen. I couldn't have contained that this long in talking about it, but. But yeah, it's, it's one of the things I love about backgammon too, is sort of every, yeah. you, you start you start off with a chance and there's this sort of romantic notion, like regardless of, of your baseline skill level. And of course, skill enormously important in all of these games, um, but you know, you can crack the window open for delusion in some of them more than others. That's great, that's great. Um, I have other questions, but um, go ahead, Cole. Go, go ahead, and then we'll turn it over to Judith for a few questions as well. Okay. Um, this really changes direction. Um, you know, anything that's funded in academia and so on and so forth. You know, um, I don't know much about that world, but there, you know, with game theory and think tank, you know, I'm not going to say think tanks, but people putting their brains to use and so on and so forth. We often hear about military intelligence interested in these kinds of quests, in these kinds of endeavors, academic endeavors. And while the practitioners think that they're, you know, just going along and, you know, uh, not getting your hands dirty, <laughs> you know, I don't want to say that, that you're getting your hands dirty, but it, is there any oversight or input or use by military intelligence of data that's collected by game theorists or in this AI world of, you know, figuring out how to crush humanity at chess? You know, are they trying to figure out Better, other ways to crush humanity, period. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I take your point. I, I mean, the answer is yes, um, but I will quickly follow that up with, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area. Um, I do know, I mean, I can point to a couple of things that I do know about. I do know that um, PhDs uh, who studied what I studied were often recruited by governmental agencies, sometimes explicitly uh, branches of the military who have their own sort of um, think tanky sort of offshoots. Um, and, and on the technology side, there's a very specific example, which I, I believe I talk about briefly in the book. Um, so there's been in the last, say, five or 10 years, a flurry of um, successful AI activity in poker. And poker was one of these final frontiers because it brought together a lot of things that were difficult for computers to sort of handle, like hugely mathematically complicated, hidden information, uncertainty in common forms of poker, lots of players, i.e. not just two, like eight or nine. And um, uh, com computers were finally successful at basically being better than the best human at kind of any form of, of commonly played poker. And one of these programs was, uh, I believe it was called Labratus. It's kind of hard to keep all these like quasi Latin uh, AI's names, right? But I believe it was the one called Labratus it was literally licensed to the Pentagon um, for, I guess, um, not uh, publicly explicit reasons, but I mean, one can imagine uh, why the Pentagon would be interested in, in strategy and, and grappling with uncertainty in, in a context that wasn't explicitly poker. So I don't know how much I can sort of reliably say beyond that, other than I think like there, there's something 
there's something to that. Interesting. I find that interesting. Um, I have, I basically have one more, uh, you know, throw out question, um, which was, um, uh, I always, as a chess player, I, I'm very competitive in terms of, you know, um, of course, um, and, or, or as a person who plays chess has been around uh, lots of games players. But I always felt a, a close analogy to sports, to physical sports. Um, and I know the Russians, for example, you know, or the Soviet Union, they really, you know, played chess as a sport. So um, are game theorists uh, interested in physical sports? Um, is that part of uh, you know, I know we're ta talking about board games, but to me, there's a, because of the, you know, one-on-one -on -one competition, like in tennis or something like that, or, um, you know, winning and losing and all of this kind of stuff. And of yeah. course, strategy and tactics, it, you know, are, is, it's outside your book, but is it? No, it's, it's a fair question. Um, again, here, I think, the short answer is yes, and I'll try to expand on that in a somewhat more interesting way. Um, I think, yeah, I think I think that the border between what are most often called games and what are most often called sports is more porous. You know, I, for example, is I oftentimes get asked the question, is chess a sport? Sure, why not? Like, it's physically, especially some form, it's physically difficult to sit somewhere for hours concentrating, like, you know, and, um, I don't see any, for just to start out, I don't see any reason why we ought not label chess a sport. That's completely fine with me. Um, do we see the tenants, the tenants and analytical tools of game theory being applied to sports capital S? I don't know. I, I think, I don't know if we see game theory proper. We certainly see mathematical tools and probabilistic and statistical tools applied to sports indeed in ways that I think we can observe. Like the example that comes most immediately to mind is basketball. Um, the idea that three point shooting has gotten so good that you might as well shoot a lot of three pointers and the game just is aesthetically utterly different because of, I think fairly fairly straightforward statistical analysis. I think, you know, baseball has been subject to deep, deep empirical statistical analysis. And I don't know that I would term this game theory per se, but I would say that sports are, admit lots of, lots of mathematical um, statistical analyses, which has changed, which have changed them. Like another sort of, I guess this is a game more than a sport, but Jeopardy has been a lot of, uh, Jeopardy has changed before our very eyes. I mean, starting in part with Watson um, and uh, sort of exemplified by James Holtzauer, was that last two, two years ago? And just this wildly aggressive um, double, daily double bidding strategy just changed the way Jeopardy is played. Um, so analyses, whatever sort of specific discipline from which they come, I think have, have deeply changed sports. There is one um, interesting uh, sports related kind of computer uh, project that I mentioned in the book uh, on curling, the uh, winter the ice stone sliding sport. Um, very strategic game, sometimes even called chess on ice. And um, I guess you could quibble with this curling a sport, but yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, and the same man, one of the same men who was a huge pioneer in um, computer poker uh, at the University of Alberta, also a pioneer in computer curling, which sort of used uh, these AI techniques to teach the Canadian national curling team sort of shot selection and what, what shot right now is going to look good three shots, three stones, four stones from now. And, you know, in Canada, this is work of uh, great national importance. That's a, that's a joke. It's a great joke. <laughs> great. Um, I don't know if Judith is still here. Are you, Judith, are you still on the Zoom? You may have logged off. Um, Judith was having some internet uh, problems. Some, okay. Some internet problems. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to her. 
Um, I think one of the questions that she wanted to ask is the research by Bernard Suits and sure. the computing with the bridge and all the challenges of that. Could you could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I, I understood those as pretty distinct questions. Is that right? Well, in any case, I'll start with Bernard Suits. Um, so one of... Um, uh, opening the book, um, I sort of grapple with this question, what is a game? And, and related to what kind of, I think what Paul and I were just talking about, like our game sports, our sports games, like what is a game? Like I encourage you to take a couple seconds and think about how you would start to define this because it seems A, like a very huge class of things and B, a sort of slippery class of things. Like they can be played by essentially any number of players they can be played with kind of any equipment, with no equipment at all, in a short amount of time, in a long amount of time. You know, there's sort of across any dimension you can think of, games seem to almost span it. Um, so I talk about this sort of philosophical even question, if you like, and talk about some early uh, or earlier attempts by philosophers to answer this question. And, you know, people as sort of illustrious as, uh, Wittgenstein took up this question and, and he sort of punted and he famously um, pointed to what he called uh, family resemblances. So games are, a game is a thing that shares with other games certain family resemblances, just like members of some extended family would share some resemblances. And this isn't really a proper definition. This is kind of um, resigning that question. But along in like the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, excuse me, comes a far, far lesser known philosopher named Bernard Suits, um, who wrote this uh, lovely, beautiful, hilarious, profound, very, very short book uh, called The Grasshopper. And The Grasshopper comes from uh, the Aesop fable, The Ant and the Grasshopper. So for Aesop, um, the ant is the hero. The ant is the one who scurries around all summer gathering seeds, knowing that the winter is looming and stockpiling them. And the grasshopper is the dummy who whistles through the meadow, plays games all day, collects no seeds, and uh-oh, winter's here and has to sort of beg off the ant. Um, but for suits, surprise, surprise, uh, the grasshopper, the player, is, is the hero. And Suits offers uh, like a, I don't know how many words, a 10 word definition. It says a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles, full stop. So voluntary attempt, um, you also may be familiar with the, like, the idea of loose, illusory attitude or illusory mind, this idea that we're willing to enter into a playful situation. So that's, that's the voluntary attempt you and I have chosen under no duress to play this game. And um, the involuntary obstacles are the rules, essentially, the rules of the game. So we've agreed to play basketball and we've decided to do this silly thing where I have to bounce the ball along the floor as I walk down the court. And we also did this silly thing where we put the basket up really high for no good reason and so on and so on. And same with chess, right? Like we've decided that I'm not allowed to knock all your pieces off of the board in the middle of the game and so on. So that's a game, that's a game for Bernard Suits. Um, and I, I, if I recommend any book today that's not my own, uh, The Grasshopper is uh, fantastic. Um, what was the question? The question was about Bernard Suits. Um, so yeah, that's, Bern that's Bernard Suits. Um, I think the sharpest sort of philosopher who, who worked on games and, um, uh, he sort of, the culmination of, of his sort of research project uh, on games was a paper called, Is Life a Game We Are Playing? And his conclusion was, maybe. Um, so uh, Bernard Suits is a really interesting guy. Um, and I'm happy to talk about more of this kind of once we open it up later, I guess. The, the second question was about bridge, is that right? Bridge and AI. It, uh, it, AI has not been able to. Right, right, sure. Um, um, yeah. So, bridge. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. So as as you go as you go through the book, um, you may find the sort of common theme, which is computers are better 
than us, even the best of us at, at all of these games, until you get to bridge. And you may be by that point quite relieved uh, to learn that um, hum the best humans are still better um, at bridge than the best computers, at least as at the kind of holistic game as played by, by humans in, in tournaments and so on. And I think there's sort of two, two reasons for that. I should note though, this is changing, like, like literally like this week and last week, this might be um, changing with new work that I don't know enough about to really talk about, but there's ongoing developments anyway. Let's assume that's not the case and that we're still better. Um, why, why is that true? Um, so I think there's two, two, a two-pronged answer. One is sort of the romantic version of the answer, which is that bridge is this very human game that requires communication and partnership and um, empathy for friend and foe and sort of all these like capital H human characteristics on top of which it's incredibly mathematically complicated and deep and, and so on. So maybe that has provided a sort of shell of resistance against the computer. The other reason, and, and unfortunately probably the more convincing reason is that bridge is sort of a dying game and sort of lacks the popularity, at least in the sort of popular imagination to incentivize an enterprising computer scientist or an enormous company like Google who con conquered Go um, and chess in its own way um, to sort of, you know, at, at the end of the day, a lot of these AI games projects, part of their purpose is as, as PR stunt. And I think the idea is, well, if you, if you do that with bridge, a lot of people will say what's bridge. Um, but like I said, um, there's there's work ongoing, and 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 even indeed in this sort of quote unquote failed AI project on Bridge, one finds very colorful characters, including a man named Matt Ginsberg, who is a large focus of the Bridge chapter of my book, and he is the closest thing to a mad scientist I have ever met in real life. Um, so uh, even even though the computers don't win, the computer scientists provide a good deal of um, entertainment. I guess. Great. Um, before we open it up to our audience, I have two quick questions. And one is, you know, there's some wonderful, your wonderful discoveries of and, and research into the ancient games, you know, Senate, the Egyptian Senate, uh, for example. And I just wondered if you, you want to share any of those anecdotes with us uh, or even do a short reading, uh, if there's anything that you'd like to read from the oh, book. That's an interesting idea. Um, let me let me take a quick glance at what I have in mind and, and see how long this is. I don't want to like drone on too long, but um, yeah, sure. But I, I, I do have a page or two in mind. Right. Give our audience a little bit of a taste of your writing style. With 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 humans um, being bested by all these AI. Um, programs, perhaps the, uh, the human response of knocking the pieces off the board is our last, uh, you know, is, is what it shows to be a human being. Yeah, uh, let's, let's see what the computer irrational. does about that, huh? <laughs> yeah, the irrational, Dostoevsky's irrational man. Well, I, how about this? I'll, I'll just start reading at the beginning of Backgammon. And if I feel like I'm boring myself, then I'm pretty confident that I'm boring others and I'll stop. Um, so this is uh, inspired by um, Laura's question about uh, the ancient sort of origins. And then I have something else I'd like to say about it. So uh, anyway, here I go. Uh, 90 years ago, a team of archeologists, surveyors, and dozens of workmen traveled down the Nile on a pair of large sailboats, distinctive and magnificent vessels called dahabias, loaded with documents, equipment, and tins of food. It had recently been decided that the massive Aswan Dam in the Southeast of Lower Nubia, I'm sorry, in the Southeast of Egypt was to be heightened, a project that would flood swaths of Lower Nubia. The team raced to excavate and catalog the re region's ancient sites before they were engulfed. They embarked during three consecutive winters to avoid the heat. The first two seasons of painstaking work, however, 
brought disappointingly few discoveries, nothing that would eclipse the earlier archeological finds to the north. But during the final season in 1931, the group arrived at the Royal Cemetery of Kustul. In an otherwise empty desert amid only a few scattered palm and acacia trees, they saw a group of earthen mounds, some more than 40 feet high. After climbing one and observing its perfectly circular shape, the team began to quote, consider the possibility of them being the work of man. Others had gazed upon mounds like these before. None had cataloged what was beneath them. With their funds running low, the team took a calculated gamble. They outlaid the 200 pounds such work would cost and they began to dig. In the side of one mound, they looked upon a passage, just two feet tall, left by grave robbers, perhaps a thousand years earlier. They cleared the debris from the ancient robber's path, crawling on their hands and knees, and after 50 feet or so, smashed through a wall and into a tomb. It turned out to be one of 61 tombs they'd find under the mounds at Kustul, and in this one, the largest of them all, objects filled it, quote, like currants in a cake. The team found an elaborately embossed leather shield. They found a wood and iron spear, a quote, most formidable weapon. And they found an ivory knife decorated with the image of Bas, the Egyptian god of fertility. Deeper down still, they came upon another object, one that at first appeared something like a picture frame. Its elaborate underside was inlaid with ivory and its corners were bracketed with silver. It was also marked with rows of 12 squares and sported a silver carrying handle. Beneath the object in a leather pouch, they discovered 15 ivory pieces, 15 ebony pieces, and a set of ivory dice. Uh, and it goes on from there. Um, so this is one of you know, countless sort of Egyptologist expeditions or other sort of early archeological work that sort of everywhere, um, folks dug, uh, they found games. And in many cases, they were also able to unriddle the rules of those games, either by sort of analyzing the, the physical object itself or finding written, in some cases, written rules on you know, tablets or, or otherwise. And in, in some cases, those games bore remarkable similarity to games that we still play today. So in this case, backgammon. Um, this game in particular is Roman of Roman origin, uh, called the Game of Twelve Signs. Um, so different, but remarkably similar to backgammon. And I sort of include these stories, I think, be, be for, you know, they stand alone as interesting stories, but I find the longevity of games absolutely remarkable. I mean, games that were played in, you know, ancient bygone cities in ancient empires are played by us today and maybe by me later tonight. And this sort of like thick and durable strand through human history, um, I find deeply fascinating and it makes me very happy. And now bridging between the ancient to the future, there, there's a wonderful quote that perhaps you could illuminate that games are clues to the future. Can you talk about that concept? Yeah, so this is, this is Suits again, um, talking there. And um, so Suits is back to my, my hero Suits. Um, so the, I, I mentioned the Grasshopper. Um, the subtitle of the Grasshopper is called, it's called like Games, Life, and Utopia, something like that. And Suits has a very specific uh, thing that he means when he says utopia. So Suits, again, writing in the 70s, uh, 1970s, um, imagines a near future world where technology has solved many of our sort of um, immediate problems, i.e. we're well housed, we're well fed, we're well clothed, sort of the basic stuff is taken care of. And the question is, well, what do we do then? And his answer is games. We play games, and he says that the, you know the 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 august institutions of today, which are for the most part erected to sort of satisfy these immediate desires that we've now taken care of, will be replaced by institutions that foster and promote and improve the playing of games. 
And so for Suits, he, this is not my word, he calls games our salvation. This idea that we need to sort of start seeding this idea and seeding these institutions that will take us through past utopia because utopia could run the, runs the risk of being very boring essentially. And like, if we don't have any um, necessary obstacles, right? We need to gin up unnecessary obstacles as from his definition of, of what a game is in the first place. So as a lover of games, I find the notion of games being our salvation extremely provocative and appealing. I find the impending arrival of utopia somewhat less likely perhaps than Suits did. Um, but, but that's his idea that sort of there, there, even, even if there's nothing else going on, we will be fascinated um, by games. And, and I'll, I'll mention another quote, which is um, Irving Finkel, who's a famous philologist at the British Museum, uh, says that games were um, so widely played in the ancient world because there was, quote, bugger all to do and things were too difficult. Um, and I think that, you know, we can all relate to times that were too difficult and where there was bugger all to do, right? And indeed, more games were played during the pandemic than at any time in human history. I think there's a fairly slam dunk empirical case to be made that that's true. So um, games are the past, games are the future, games are the present. <laughs> Thanks, Oliver. Um, I think we can now open it up to our questions in the audience. In the audience, we have chess players. I see a few Go players there and um, and also other people who are Scrabble lovers. So um, please put your questions in the chat and Pam will be reading off the questions and we'll have a conversation. Well, the first question that comes up is um, the, 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 is an interesting comment. Arlene Baxter points out that the Turk, the famous 19th century chess automaton, would sometimes sweep the pieces off the board if the human opponent played an obviously silly or illegal move. So I think that's kind of a, apparently that's an important component of games. They, they, um, the first artificial game player had that reaction programmed in. But George Sifri, the first question is George Sifri asks, I'm wondering if there are many diagrams in the book to where it would deter someone from listening to it in audio format. It's a very practical question. You just a very good question about which I thought a lot. Um, I tried to only include them when I thought that that they really added something for um, the sort of lay reader, i.e., the the non-game expert. So it's not chock a block with chess diagrams or anything. I would say on average maybe two a chapter. And I, I certainly wrote around the diagrams uh, so as to make it um, very palatable and hopefully better than palatable uh, listen. But no, very good question. And I just want to point out, here's the cover of the book, fabulous. And as as mentioned, there are, there are diagrams. <laughs> okay, carry on. So Diane asks, do you think the development of unbeatable AI programs has increased interest in games such as chess and go? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think one thing that it has done, these programs have done unquestionably is democratize like skill in these games and accelerate its sort of dissemination. So I think, just leaving aside the popularity question just for a second, um, I think, you know, we've seen a sort of rising tide lifts all boats in, in, in almost every game and poker 100%. Um, chess, I, I imagine, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, but chess, I imagine, just sort of seen um, the average sort of quality, at least at a kind of competitive level increase. And, and why? Well, in the poker example, um, you don't need to live near a casino or a card room, or you don't even need to have friends, right? You can, you can log onto the computer. You don't need to be 21 um, to get into the casino. Like all these sort of barriers to entry have fallen in backgammon, whereas maybe you used to have to, 
live near a good teacher or a good club. So you had to live in New York or London or, or whatever. Now you can live anywhere and you just download XG, which is the most popular, uh, the strongest backend in software these days. And you just play it and you get pretty good pretty quickly. And you can play a lot more than people used to be able to play because you simply play faster thanks to the computer. You don't have to shuffle the cards or even put the chess pieces back in the squares or, or anything. So one thing I can unquestionably say is skill level, the like human skill level, broadly speaking, has increased in, in a like democratic and appealing way. Have they directly caused, I mean, I, I think technology has certainly caused increases in, in like popularity, like as measured by just like number of people playing. I mean, chess in the pandemic, um, uh, playing online, chess streaming, like uh, on Twitch, um, live streaming chess, just like uh, kids live stream video games. Right, like chess has sort of transmogrified into esport for a certain section of like the chess of chess audience, chess loving um, people. Very true. Have, yeah. So technology, without a doubt, the AI in particular, I'm not sure. I mean, it's it probably didn't it probably didn't hurt, but it's it's a tough question because like there's a question about the very pin what happens to the very very pinnacle of the game, like the people who used to be actually competing against the computer and what happens to the sort of rank and file. And I would like separate those two questions out because an extreme example would be Lee Seedahl, the great um, Go player often compared in the Western press to like Roger Federer in terms of stature and, and skill and popularity, quit Go, um, retired early. And, and he said it was because AlphaGo, this computer program, uh, was the best Go playing entity in the universe and he was no longer interested in playing it. So that's, you know, one less Go player, arguably. Um, this answer is becoming way too long, um, but I think technology, of course, has been um, a huge uh, accelerant to games playing. So Donald Traeger's question, when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, chess was getting really popular to watch on TV. Nowadays, poker is televised on ESPN and League of Legends World Championships will sell out the, chess, the Chase Center. 18, 20K paying customers. Has there ever been a period in the past where there was so much passive interest in people watching other people play games? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, my mind immediately goes back to the sport versus games question, right? I mean, if, if sports are games, then we've watched people play games for a very long time. Um, but I, I don't, that's probably not quite what Donald was asking. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I am pretty fascinated by the like professional esport culture um, and League of Legends and other games and how many, like exactly like you say, sort of passive appreciation there is. But there again, I'm not sure always how passive it really is. And what I mean by that is I think like lots of kids who, and I'm no longer a kid, so I'm speaking out of school, but um, I think lots of kids are watching with the idea that they can, they will one day be a professional video game player. And I think a lot of the professional um, video game streamers oft, oft, also do, um, you know, like lessons YouTube lessons and stuff. So I think it's, a, it's almost a kind of like aspirational um, appreciation rather than passive appreciation. Maybe there's a little something to that. And then I also, I also think, and this is just my personal impression, that the online audience for like popular chess streamers is, are also arriving, yes, to appreciate this person playing, but also for an educational experience. Um, you know, like if you see Hikaru Nakamura, like he'll talk like while he's playing. And I'm, I don't know if this is the best way to learn chess, but there's a communication happening, which, you know, I don't think I seek when I watch football. Like, yeah, like Jim Nance is telling me that it's this kind of like coverage that they're running on defense or whatever. But I don't I don't think I'm there to like learn. I don't know. I'm making this up as I go, but I feel like there's a nugget of something there. So the next question is from um, Anand. How does game theory as applied to real life events account for humans being fundamentally unknowable? 
and do not predictably act out of self-interest, um, as in I have to win. I mean, that's a tough one. I, I think, well, I'll, I'll answer it this way. And while I'm talking, I'll try to think of a better answer. Um, I think game theory, when it was sort of invented, roughly speaking, um, 70 years ago, sort of held this implicit promise that like uh, we, meaning a few nerds sitting around with like pencils, will be able to unriddle the entirety of like human behavior because we've developed this study of the interaction of small groups of humans. And yeah, this idea that with game theory, we could sort of study anything. And, you know, that's clearly that the field clearly did not live up to that promise, but it has lived up to its promise in, in specific domains where humans are, are basically incentivized to be rational and act with self-interest. So one of those would be just like a, an actual game you know, in the sense that we've been talking about most of the time. And two, the, the example that comes to mind and a famous one are, are auctions. Um, so auctions is probably the maybe the most studied class of game uh, in game theory. And these aren't just, you know, like silent auctions for charity. I and mean, these can be like billion dollar auctions for like slices of the broadband spectrum, where it's like Google bidding against AT&T bidding against the US government or whatever. So there are this, and that's not the only example, but there are like slices of the real world that are very accurately captured by the analyses of game theory. But like, also I think what you're describing is a problem for economics as a, as a discipline broadly and not just game theory. I mean, economics, at least like neoclassical economics relies on this idea of homo economicus sort of infinitely calculating and self-interested and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a model and, you know, like all models, it's wrong. And like some models, it's useful. It's a very deep question, uh, but I appreciate it. I have a question from Echo. I had two questions, one about the origin of chess, although it has been said it was in India, there are evidence that it was invented in the Persian empire. Have you ever heard anything about it? And what about backgammon? Where was it invented? I know my dad has been playing it and it is an extremely popular between Kurdish people in all four parts, in Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria. Yeah, I don't, what I know about chess is that there's lots of theories, many of them conflicting about its origins. Um, that's, that's what I know. Um, yeah, the, I think the India sort of 1500 years ago is kind of the, the standard issue history. Um, I don't, I don't know much more beyond it sounds like what you know already, so I apologize. Um, and I think I think a twin a twin problem is when a lot of ancient games like backgammon were racing games, and a lot of games like backgammon use dice, but you know they weren't backgammon. And there's a there's a problem. It's just like when do you start calling backgammon backgammon? Sort of how similar. Like how distant of a relative are you willing to say, oh, this is backgammon, how recent? Um, and you know, you find you and, and you're the the victim of like conquest. So the game found in Castul in Lower Nubia was Roman because Romans arrived, you know, on ships and deposed Cleopatra or whatever they did. And so you find all this Roman stuff there. Um, so unfortunately, my, my archaeology um, knowledge is, is not deep and certainly not up, up to date, um, but millennia in backgammon's case, I think is pretty fair to say. But I, here's you know, yet another complicating feature. The best part of backgammon is the doubling cube, and the doubling cube was not invented until, by most accounts, uh, the early 20th century um, in New York City by some unknown uh, genius. So even games, even ancient games can radically change in a short amount of time. And, you know, it's still backgammon, but um, not the one like Cleopatra played. Um, Chapin Boyer asks, how many of these AIs are designed to present not just the strongest opponent, but the most entertaining opponents? Do the Go and chess AIs tend to have settings that allow lower level opponents to engage with them? 
I think the answer is definitely yes. I think a lot of these systems, especially like commercial systems that sort of derive from the research certainly have um, difficulty settings. Um, you know, I and people who know more about this than chess should, should chime in. But as I understand it, it's a very difficult problem to make a computer play like a not strong human, to make it play believably weakly, right? This is not, um, and I see maybe Paul wants to, to say something, but yeah, I, I think- mean, I, I advise my students or anybody interested in playing chess um, to not play computers because um, they, they, the way they play is illogical. And like you said, um, uh, uh, for example, Carlson, the world champion, he won't play a computer, he describes a computer this way as an idiot that beats him all the time. So um, that's, and also, like you said, Oliver, that they cannot, um, they'll, they'll play a, a bunch of good moves and then because it's supposed to be at a dumbed down level, it'll suddenly play a completely ridiculous move. So it's, it, it doesn't have a, a logic to it. It's not playing chess, it's playing something else. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but. So um, yeah, I think, I, I think certainly not the most sort of entertaining version of the game in many cases, certainly not to play against, but I do think there, there's a certain sort of entertainment and aesthetic beauty to be found in sort of the exotic way that that top engines play and sort of unexpected way. And indeed, Go um, in Go, sort of this game we've been playing for 5,000 years, in, in some ways we turned out to have been playing it wrong, right? Like, because this computer and this computer played these moves that at, at the time AlphaGo was playing Lee Doll, people were laughing, literally laughing at the computer because its moves were so unexpected and odd looking but um, possibly, possibly the right ones. So um, Mr. Yadari has another question. Um, second question is about complexity. I heard that Go could be the most complex one, but my research and bias as a chess player showed because the chess pieces don't have the same values like backgammon or checkers, it makes it much more complex. Any thought on this? And he also wants you to know, I listened to your podcast on Perpetual Chess Pod. It was great. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, so I, I think there's a number of ways that we could think of, like, what do we mean when we say complexity? And the most common one, the most common definition that sort of trotted out in the AI research has to do with how many, basically how many possible positions are there in this game? How many ways could a, ga a game of chess play? So if you imagine these games as trees where every branch is a possible move into the future, how many leaves does this tree have? And as measured thusly, Go is just incomprehensibly larger than chess. But I don't think one ought to read too much into that. I mean, that's a very mathematical definition that I think has relatively little to do with the lived experience of playing it as a human being. It does have something to do with the lived experience of a computer, or at least a certain kind of computer playing that game. Um, so I think that's that's the source of the this idea that Go is sort of the most complex game that humans play. It's certainly, not the most complex and many other definitions of complex, like in some ways it's the simplest, right? There's one type of piece and there's one type of move. There's like two rules in the whole game, right? And it seems discovered rather than invented. And more than one commentator has said, if we ever discover intelligent extraterrestrial life, they too surely play Go. Like this is just a game that was discovered and not invented. So in that sense, it's the starkest and simplest and most beautiful. And I, I wasn't, I didn't quite catch the thing about the, the pieces um, being worth different. I mean, that's certainly true in chess. It's also certainly true in Go, is it not? Like they, they're not explicitly different, but like, I think part of the game is identifying the value in various parts of the board and, and so on. So I don't know that I have a, 
I feel like I'm 0 for 2 or 0 for 3 answering uh, this gentleman's question, so I apologize. But um, I think complexity and simplicity uh, can mean a lot of different things. And I think Go is very, very complex and very, very simple. And I'll leave it there. Um, Anand Rajaramand uh, asks, how much of a grounding in mathematics do you need to understand strategy for certain games like poker? Would you recommend a crash course in combinatorial math? Or do you speak the language of us laypersons in your book? In my book, I certainly speak the language of laypersons um, very intentionally uh, because I want you to buy many copies, not because you're specifically lay, but because I want you to feel welcomed no matter who you are, expert or lay. Um, how much math do you need to play a game? Like, I don't think much. I really don't think much. Uh, I think it, in math and meaning like in terms of like performing calculations or some sort of linear algebraic thing at the table. I think you, what's more important is, is a sort of logical grounding. And yes, in poker, you need to calculate odds and the ratio between uh, the, the bet that your opponent made and the size of the pot and how likely are you to hit your straight on the river or whatever. But these are extremely, I mean, this is elementary school math. But I think what's more important in becoming a good poker player is this is is a very game theoretic idea and by that i mean imagining what your opponent um will do next and sort of what has he done and therefore what can i uh infer about what cards he has this sort of logical getting into the mind of your opponent like okay i know pre-flop he called and after the flop he check raised and you know that kind of thing what what might he have and i think the actual calculation calculation mathematical calculation is a very very small um part of this in my fairly amateur opinion um but in terms of recommendation i would say rather than math books to read poker books i mean probably just starting with theory of poker the classic david sklansky book and two plus two uh, is his publisher um Lots of good uh, poker books. I have an additional question from Chapin Boyer. Um, is there any research that you know of working on Mancala style games? At the NYU Game Center, we discussed the four global games with Mancala being one of them. And I wondered if it was receiving similar AI development. Oh, that's cool. I've, I've been to the NYU Game Center and know its former director, a very, very special place, actually like a block from my apartment. Um, Moncala, yes, the answer is yes, but unfortunately I don't know much about it. Um, there, I believe there's a version, so there's lots of sort of versions and variants of Moncala, and I believe one of them uh, is, a, is a solved game, which is sort of this uh, it's a rare class of interesting game where the computer can actually play perfectly, i.e. you could tie with or beat God if you played him. This is kind of the shorthand. So the answer is yes. And um, I encourage you to look it up uh, elsewhere if you're interested, because I'm sorry, I don't know much about it. Um, I'm sorry, was there a second part to that question? Uh, that, was the, that was the entirety of the question. And um, I will, let me, if I may, um, just interject to say, um, I often get asked about um, various games, not often Mancala, but th I'm glad you did. Uh, why, like, what's going on with them? And, and I'm making a list because uh, there'll be, you know, seven games, the sequel, seven more games. Um, so I'm just keeping track of uh, Dominoes is one I get asked about a lot. Ma uh, Mahjong is one I get asked about a lot. So thank you. I will put you in the acknowledgments of book two. Great. Well, I want to thank Oliver Roder for inspiring us uh, about these Seven Games and his new book, Seven Games, A Human History. Um, we look forward to um, sharing more with you in the future. And of course, when you're here in San Francisco, we'll, we'd love to have you uh, enjoy Mechanics Institute and our chess club. And I also want to thank our chess staff, uh, Paul Whitehead and Judith Sachere for joining us today. And thank you, our audiences. Come back. Um, on our next programs and come down to Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street in San Francisco. Once again, thank you so much.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks.